Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Vedana Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Friday gathering. Thank you for coming to our home today. We really appreciate it. It's been some time since we've had a program in our house, <laughs> so it's nice to have everybody back. So last week we discussed this very important verse. What verse did we discuss? Two point one three. Two point one three. Yes. What did we discuss in 2.13? The kids are not The kids are not listening. What did we discuss in 2.13? Important verse or just another verse? Very important. Very important. What did we learn? To remain sober. To remain sober. Does that mean no more booze, no more uh, drugs? Mm -hmm. Is that the meaning of sober? What is the uh, what is the sobriety that we are speaking of? No more turbulence of emotions. No more turbulence. The mind going turbulent. Anybody has turbulence in their mind once in a while? <laughs> <laughs> we all do. That is that is the nature of the material world. Just like you know, we we know the nature of living. In Michigan in January is mm -hmm. not rain, right? <laughs> <laughs> Somehow it's been raining recently, but that's you know, it's cold weather. It is what it is. That is the nature. But the nature of the material world is that the mind will remain turbulent under one scenario. What is that scenario? When does the mind remain turbulent? Attachments to? Different materialistic things. Attachment to materialistic things. Yeah. Problem. Confused. Problem. Confused. Huh? And then problems. What's that? Problems. Problems. Yeah, we face different problems, right? Yeah. When we forget Krishna. When we forget Krishna, yes. Emotions. Or our emotions. Right? Emotions are nature. Right? Yeah. So remember, what was the state of Arjuna's mind at the beginning of this Bhagavad Gita? Was he very calm and peaceful? No. <laughs> and yeah. Huge turbulence, right? And huge confusions. He had anxiety, fear, stress. He was so much so that he was like shaking and quivering. Right? And this is a very powerful personality, Arjun. Not any ordinary person. Right? So that was his state. So Krishna is speaking to help Arjuna. And Krishna is only has one goal. He's not trying to kill time. He's actually in a very tight situation, right? In the middle of the battlefield. So he's not looking just to you know, create some idle chat, maybe pass time with some convicts. He's speaking on very important topics. Right? And his goal in speaking this entire Bhagavad Gita is singular. It is to give Arjuna peace and happiness. To free him from all the turbulences that he is facing. Any of us want to be free of all of our turbulences? <laughs> Full of peace and happiness? We all want it. And we're all searching for it. That is the commonality of every single living entity. Nobody is not looking for this. Everybody's looking for the same thing. And Krishna is giving the answer in this Bhagavad of how to find it. And this establishes one of the foundational principles. If we don't see the world through this verse, then everything else we observe is going to be 
distorted. Just like I said, if I am wearing blue colored glasses, how is everything going to appear to me? Blue? Blue? Yeah, blue. Mm -hmm. But is everything blue? No. But I'm seeing everything as blue. So what's the problem? Perception. My perception. The lens from which I'm viewing everything is when it's dark blue, then everything thereafter that I assess, that I evaluate, that I draw conclusions upon is going to be wrong. Some of you have taken a, you know, advanced mathematics. Remember when you had those long problems, you had like 12 steps in the problem? If you mess up the first step, no matter you get the other 11 right, what happens? It's wrong. You get it wrong, right? There's nothing you can do because the first step was wrong. So Arjuna is being guided here by Krishna that the first thing we have to do is know definitively one thing. And what is, Arjuna, what is Krishna telling Arjuna in that 13th verse that we should and must understand? First topic of that spiritual the soul is there, you just change the body. Yes. So the soul is there but the body is changing. So, the question is, am I this body or am I soul? I'm soul. Because if I ask the question, who were you a hundred years ago? Who will you be a hundred years from now? Normally when we ask, hey, identify yourself, we say, you know, we pull out our driver's license or passport and say, this is who I am, this is my profession, this is my citizenship, this is this, that. But these are all, are these permanent descriptions of who I am? No. They're temporary. Very temporary. So Krishna is saying, if you make decisions in the world based on something you're not, of course you're not going to find peace of mind. And the example we can give, Prabhupada, how did Prabhupada help us understand the soul within this body? By a very wonderful metaphor. Driver and the? Car. The car. All of us came in a car today? Yes. All the cars are out in the driveway? Yes. Are they moving right now? Are they going anywhere? No. Why? The soul is moving. What's not in the car? Driver. driver. So the car needs a driver. Right? So this body, it is no different than a car. Different configuration, different model, but it's made up of the same elements even. Different minerals, different you know, metals, different objects, you know, it's the same objects. So this body, it also needs a driver. What is the driver of this body? So. And so, taking to that car analogy, if we spent our whole life, from childhood to old age, only trying to give our car happiness, would we be happy? Would we feel fulfilled? Would we feel peaceful, accomplished? We would always be felt. So it is no different when we spend our existence simply trying to give happiness to the body. It is not fulfilling because it's not who we are. Now, the car is important to us, right? Why is the car important to us? It moves us from one place to the other place, right? But who is the determinant of where we go? The car or us? Yes. The driver. So who is serving who? We are serving the car or the car is serving us? So the same with our body. Our body is important. It's a vehicle. It helps us accomplish things. But are we to serve the body? Or the body to serve us. Body is the means to accomplish the goal.
goals of the soul. As the car accomplishes the goals of the driver. If I want to go from my house to Bhakta Riksha, the car is the means by which I can come. But the decisioning factor is what the driver and the passengers want. Okay? So similarly, in our life, if my decisions are made on only what is good for my body and forgetting what is actually good for my soul, I'm going to get into this situation where I'm finding turbulence. And so Krishna is saying, Virastata Namuyati. Vira means a sober person, a person whose mind is very calm <coughs> and peaceful. Even in the midst of turbulent situations. What is the most turbulent situation we will face? Death. Huh? Death. Death. That is the most turbulent situation we will face. That is where our sobriety will be tested to the fullest. And Krishna is saying, one who understands their spirit soul, they are not bewildered. Even in that most stressful of circumstances. Because they have knowledge that I am spirit soul. Yes? I'm just curious if um, are all souls the same? Do we all have the same soul? So, it's a great question. Um, so, our souls are all made up of the same elements, but we are all individual. Okay. So, your soul is not the same as my soul. My soul is not the same as your soul. This plant has a soul. Not the same soul, but all of the same source. So, just like five children from one mother and father. Are they all the same? They're not the same, but they're in the same family. They all come from the same mother and father. So all of our souls come from the same source. And what is, who is the source of our soul? Krishna. And how do we know? Scriptures. Scriptures. Krishna says right in Bhagavad Gita, and so the reason we know that our souls are not the same is because in the prior verse, the 12th verse, Krishna tells us that never was there a time that we did not exist, nor in the future shall we cease to be. This directly speaks to our individuality. So we all as spirit souls have individuality. That is eternal. We have individuality here in the material world. And if and when, I should say when, not if, when we all go back home to Godhead, to the spiritual world, you also will have individuality. You'll have yourself as a person. As a person interacting with other persons, including the Supreme Person, the Purushottama, So that individuality is eternal. Not only here in the material world, but also in the spiritual world. So, now the soul, being made up of the same material, all of our souls have the same uh, propensity. Just like, um, so, the soul disconnected from spirit won't find happiness. And they give the example of fish out of water. Right? A fish out of water, no matter what material accoutrements you give, won't find happiness. Right? No, you can give it jewels, you can you know glorify it, and you can give it you know all kinds of wonderful foods because it's out of water, it's out of its natural environment, won't find happiness. Right? When that fish returns to water, it becomes happy. This topic we've discussed many times. So our soul, until we reconnect it with spirit, it won't find happiness. Now the question may arise, well, what about you know, my soul versus your soul? Maybe we have different points of happiness. So that is true. We might have different varieties of enjoyment together. But if I have three different species of fish on the beach in this beautiful you know, tent with all these accoutrements, will any of the fish be happy? 
They're all different. But will any of them be happy? Because the nature of the fish, no matter what variety it is, is to be in water. So the common feature of all fish is they have to be in water. So similarly, the common feature, the nature, the intrinsic nature of every soul is to serve Krishna. That is the eternal nature of the soul. And that is the universal fact for all souls. Just like it is the universal fact for all fish that they must be in water, similarly also. And there's a reason for that. Why is it the universal fact that every soul ultimately finds its peace in relationship with Krishna? Why? He is a supreme. He is a supreme. He is a supreme. Okay. Part of and from the Krishna soul. Every soul is part and parcel of Krishna. Is that one soul is part and parcel of Krishna, another soul is part and parcel of something else, and there's no. They all come from one singular source. And that's why Lord Brahma said, Anadi Adi is Govinda. That he is the source of all sources. So because of that, this principle is universal. It is completely irrelevant to the type of body we have, whether I am tall, short, male, female, white, dark, this, that, fish, tree, monkey, human, fly, mosquito, doesn't matter. Those are all vehicles. Cars. What matters is the person within, the soul. And that is the nature of the soul. Okay? So Krishna establishes this very important fact in the 13th verse that one who understands the soul is not bewildered. They can find peace. And if we really look at any situation in which we find great turbulence of the mind, if we look at that situation from the perspective I am spirit soul you'll actually find great clarity of how to understand that and so Krishna tells us in the 14th verse he says O Sanakunti the non-permanent appearance and happiness and distress and their disappearance in due course are like the appearance and disappearance of the winter and summer seasons so what should we do he says we should just tolerate that without being disturbed. So, material happiness. What is the root cause of any material happiness that we get? Why am I It's real. Right? I have some happiness. What, what is the source? Why am I getting that? Your body is feeling good, but why am I getting something really good and somebody else is getting something not so good? Based on karma. It's not arbitrary. It's not random. It's based on our karma. Based on our past activities, certain reactions manifest, right? Action equals reaction. So the future happiness and distress in the material world will get, it's going to come because we've already done those activities. So Krishna is saying you should tolerate those. But don't hanker on them. And rise your consciousness to a higher platform. If I tie my happiness to whether my car is working really well or not, is that a good logical way to go through life? That, hey, if my car is running good, the tire pressure is really solid, it's not jerking around, the shocks are really good, I am happy. And if I get a flat tire or you know the car is starting to get a little old and rusty, I am sad. Is that a, is that a good way that we would guide you know our friends and loved ones and even ourselves to go through life? 
what we would say is, yeah, you understand that the car is working now, you work to help improve that, but you have your own existence. So if we ascribe our happiness and distress to the things that are happening to the body, we are no different than trying to ascribe our happiness to whether the car is working really well or not. You know, we almost smile and laugh and thinking it's foolish. But actually that is what we do until we come out from this bodily consciousness. So Krishna is saying, yes, you're going to get some happiness and distress at the bodily level, the material level. That is based on your past karma. Just tolerate, accept it. It is what it is. And continue forward with your spiritual life. That is the, the, the main thing. Okay? So anyway, that was a really long introduction to the 17th verse. <laughs> so let us read the 17th verse and then we'll discuss it. Anybody wants to read the verse? Avinashi tu tat vidhi yena sarvam idam tatam vinasham avyash prashasya na kaskit kartum arhati. That which pervades the entire body, you should know to be indestructible. No one is able to destroy that imperishable soul. Purpured by Srila Prabhupada ki jai. This verse more clearly explains the real nature of the soul, which is spread all over the body. Anyone can understand what is spread all over the body. It is consciousness. Everyone is conscious of the pains and pleasures of the body in part or as a whole. This spreading of consciousness is limited within one's own body. The pains and pleasures of one body are unknown to another. Therefore, each and every body is the embodiment of an individual soul and the symptom of the soul's presence is perceived as individual consciousness. This soul is described as one ten thousandth part of the upper portion of the hair point in size. The Shweta Swastra Upanishad confirms this. When the upper point of a hair is divided into 100 parts and again each of such parts is further divided into 100 parts, each such part is the measurement of the dimension of the spirit soul. Similarly, the same version is stated. There are innumerable particles of spiritual atoms, which are measured as one ten thousand of the upper portion of the hair. Therefore, the individual particle of a spirit soul is a spiritual atom smaller than the material atoms, and such atoms are innumerable. This very small spiritual spark is the basic principle of the material body, and the influence of such a spiritual spark is spread all over the body as the influence of the active principle of the medicine is spread throughout the body. This current of the spirit soul is felt all over the body as consciousness, and that is the proof of the presence of the soul. Any layman can understand that the material body minus consciousness is a dead body, and this consciousness cannot be revived in the body by any means of material administration. Therefore, consciousness is not due to any amount of material combination, but due to the spirit soul. In the Mundaka Upanishad, the measurement of the atomic spirit soul is further explained. The soul is atomic in size and can be perceived by perfect intelligence. This atomic soul is floating in the five kinds of air, prana, apana, vyana, samna and udana. It is situated within the heart and spreads its influence all over the body of the embodied living entities. When the soul is purified from the contamination of the five kinds of material air, its spiritual influence is exhibited. The hat yoga system is meant for controlling the five kinds of air encircling the pure soul by different kinds of sitting postures, not for any material profit, but for liberation of the minute soul from the entanglement of the material atmosphere. So the constitution of the atomic soul is admitted in all Vedic literatures, and it is also actually felt in the practical experience of any sane man. Only the insane man can think of this atomic soul as all pervading Vishnu Tattva. The influence of the atomic soul can be spread all over a particular body. According to the Mundak Upanishad, this atomic soul is situated in the heart of every living entity. 
and because of the measurement of the atomic soul is beyond the power of appreciation of the material scientists, some of them assert foolishly that there is no soul. The individual atomic soul is definitely there in the heart along with the super soul and thus all the energies of bodily mo movement are emanating from this part of the body. The corpuscles which carry the oxygen from the lungs gather energy from the soul. When the soul passes away from this position, the activity of the blood generating fusion ceases. Medical science accepts the importance of the red cor corpuscles, but it cannot ascertain that the source of the energy is the soul. Medical science, however, does admit that the heart is the seat of all energies of the body. Such atomic particles of the spirit whole are compared to the sunshine molecules. In the sunshine, there are innumerable radiant molecules. Similarly, the fragmental parts of the Supreme Lord are atomic sparks of the rays of the Supreme Lord, called by the name Prabha or superior energy. So whether one follows Vedic knowledge or modern science, one cannot deny the existence of the spirit soul in the body. And the science of the soul is explicitly described in the Bhagavad Gita by the personality of Godhead himself. Long purport. Um, this is Shiva Prabhupada's supreme um, potency to be able to explain to us in clear terms something that is very subtle. And like if you want to understand, you know, what a piece of cake is like, it's easy for us to understand. I can see it, I can touch it, I can feel it, I can taste it. I mean, it's tangible. It doesn't take a rocket scientist, even a small child can explain to us a piece of cake. But to understand something subtle, like if you want to understand, you know, wave energy, it takes much more in-depth presence because I cannot see it, I cannot touch it, I can maybe experience it. It's, it's very subtle for me. Right? To understand something that, like the soul, is even more subtle than that. It takes great um, uh, knowledge and information and ability to present. And Shiva Prabhupada does this very wonderfully to help us understand, like this car and driver. He makes it so clear for us to understand how the soul is presented within the body. And then like this, he's explaining many aspects of the soul. So let's discuss a few points of this verse. So the verse again reads, that which pervades the entire body he should know to be indestructible. No one is able to destroy the imperishable soul. So, how do we know if something has a soul? What is the proof of the presence of a soul within any object? The heart beat. Movement. Heart beat. Consciousness. Ultimately, it's consciousness. Right? So there are some living entities that don't have a heart, per se. But they have a soul. The soul is understood by consciousness. Right? Does this piece of wood have a soul? Like the plant. Huh? What about the plant? The plant? Does the plant have consciousness? Yes. Yes. Even botanists will tell you. Plants have, they respond to certain types of stimulus, certain types of uh, environments. So they have consciousness. Maybe not as extensive as you and I have, but there is consciousness. So are there souls and plants? Yes. So anything that has consciousness has a soul. So in the dog, in the cat, in the monkey, in the bird, in the ant, in the worm, in the plant, in the grass, everywhere. Well, there's consciousness. This table, is there a soul? No. It's matter. Right? So consciousness is the evidence that the soul is present. And we know when someone passes away, is there consciousness? No. Because what is left? Soul is left. Soul is left. So consciousness goes away. Then we have an understanding of this body. Because what is this body when the soul passes away? It's matter. It's dead matter. Actually, it is always dead. But what is giving life to this body? The soul. What is the source of energy to this body? 
the chapatis and rice and cake we eat? What is the soul? The soul is what is giving the ultimate source of energy to this body. And we know that. As soon as the soul is gone, no matter what you feed the body, no matter what instruments you put into it, is it going to work? So consciousness is the proof of the soul present within any thing we can ascertain. And the soul has limited consciousness, right? If, if, if I stub my toe, do you say, ouch? <coughs> because your soul is perceiving what's happening in your body. And my soul is perceiving what's happening in my body, in others, right? We may have emotions of empathy and understanding somebody else's experiences. And so when I see you stub your toe, I say, ooh, because I know what it's like. But I am not actually feeling that pain. I'm feeling the emotion of empathy. Two different things. Okay? But the understanding is that consciousness is limited. But Krishna is super soul. What is his consciousness? And what does that mean? He feeds everything. He feels everything. He knows everything. Any of you know what's in my head right now? I mean, a good thing. <laughs> I don't know what's in it. Right? We don't know. Even though we know each other so well, we have consciousness of our own thoughts, of our own mind, of our own understanding. But Krishna, being the super soul, he has consciousness of everything. He has perfect knowledge of each and every one of us in our circumstances, our situations, what's happening. So this is the difference between our soul and Krishna. Limited, unlimited. How big is the soul? Minute. How minute? It's kind of atom. But what's the size? I want to know the size. One ten thousandth part of the proportion of the hair pointing. One ten thousandth mm -hmm. tip of hair. Mm -hmm. If I had a hair, I'd pull one out <laughs> and then cut it in a hundred and then cut that into a hundred, but I'm all saved. <laughs> Few of you are joining me. How do we know? Have we put it on uh, some under some microscope and did some measurements? It's written in. Huh? It's written in Gita. It's written in scripture. To acquire knowledge of the soul, no material endeavor, no material apparatus can understand. Because one is made up of matter, one is made up of spirit. So to acquire reliable knowledge on the soul, we must go to Shastra. I can have an opinion about the soul, you can have an opinion about the soul. But I'm sorry to say, my opinion means nothing and your opinion means nothing. But where we can get reliable, factual information on the soul? He who created the soul. Who is creator? Krishna. So Krishna through various shastras gives us knowledge of the soul, right? So we know how big the soul is. Where does the soul reside? How do we know? Heart beats, the heart is in nature. But how do we know for sure? To obtain this knowledge, you must go to the authorized source. Again, I can have a hypothesis, you can have a hypothesis, all the world can have a hypothesis. But at the end of the day, it is as at best a guess. So to get reliable knowledge on something subtle like the soul, we must go to Shastra. And in Shastra, the soul is very vividly described, right? taking a piece of hair, cutting it, I mean, how much more detail can we get? It is not giving some random, but it's very precise. So 
this soul but is, is it thing? still solid kind of a thing even what? if you whatever the small size it is is it still a solid well solid in what regards because matter is solid but it is spirit right so now this starts to test our understanding because the soul is spirit it is not matter we have only experienced in our physical realm matter but spirit is quote unquote solid but not in our material sense but it is a form how do we know when krishna came what is krishna's body made up of spirit he's spirit he's not made up of earth air fire water ether like we are this is made up of earth air fire water ether these four elements five elements but krishna when he appears he's sat chit ananda what is our soul made up of what are the ingredients of the soul sat chit ananda so there are ingredients earth air fire water ether are material ingredients for the material body the spiritual ingredients for the spirit soul satchitananda so the soul has form it has shape it has solidity as you understand it is not abstract but it cannot be perceived by material apparatus my material eyes cannot see the soul the material eyes powered by a very giant microscope will not be able to see the soul because the soul is spiritual and my apparatus that i'm trying to use is material material so i need a spiritual apparatus to see the spirit so people who say they see souls like mediums and they're you know those type of people are they just lying i think what they mean by that is the vision that they understand the presence of the soul right like i can say i see the soul in all of you you see the soul in all of us we understand that we have a, but am i physically seeing the light of the soul no i'm not because my eyes are not spiritual so we can understand that what the, the, they mean is they're understanding the presence of the soul within everybody you know just like for example if someone is going through a difficult time and i say i see your pain well, i'm not actually seeing your pain i'm understanding the pain so in that way you know i understand the presence of the soul within everybody as my vision and that's actually the goal that we all want to come to but if, if someone is suggesting that they can actually see the soul I mean that's not 100% accurate <laughs> like me <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people who monitor paranormal activities have devices or equipment that kind of capture the orbs that they see are those orbs soul the soul energy or what what are they it's hard to say because what they're actually writing about and what they're actually observing we, we don't know right um, <clears throat> there are you know experiences this uh, michael sabon is a doctor who wrote about these um, near death experiences that people talk mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. um, and they talk about you know this experience of being separated from their body and almost levitating above their body and, and they all speak about the same kind of experiences and he's stunned because these are i think there's 20 or so cases that he sort of documented and they're all unrelated they all don't know each other but they all come with the same and he concludes that book by saying you know there's clearly some separation <coughs> between the body and the life force I don't know if that's what the spiritualists call the soul. He wasn't quite ready to go that far, but he suggested that it probably was because that's what they were hearing and, 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 and observing, right? So, um, you know, we, we can understand that um, uh, that's likely 
you know, the, the phenomenon that they're experiencing. But again, you know, we can experience things at different levels of understanding. But to suggest that I'm like actually seeing the soul is, is not quite The atomic soul. Yeah. But Srila Prabhupada uses this word atomic soul is because we understand atomic theory, right? We understand atoms, then we understand subatomic theory, neutrons and protons and nuclear, you know, so we understand some of these, these ideas. So uh, he's using the word atomic to explain, you know, the, the very small size. And then he says in the purport that it's even smaller than the atoms that we know of. But uh, interestingly, you may uh, know that atomic theory actually resides in Srimad Bhagavatam. Just as an aside, but just to help build our faith in the power of our scriptures. In the world, anybody knows what the most accurate clock is and the clock that they use to keep the world's time? It's the atomic clock. It's the atomic clock. And they measure, it's measured by the movement of the, um, the, the, um, the, the atoms around, you know, the, the protons and neutrons that fly around. It's measured in that realm. You know where that theory comes from? Srimad Bhagavatam. Krishna and Srimad Bhagavatam is explaining that, that time is measured by the movement of these atomic particles. But anyways, that's what it means by atomic. The robot is helping us to understand that it is a, a very small size. And I've heard other acharyas talk about when they even say one ten thousandth of fifth of a hair, that is to give us some indication of its tiny portion. Just to give us some indication of its tiny portion. So, yes? So the soul, I have only one soul or within our body there are several bacteria, all living mm -hmm. all they having a soul no, so, yeah, good point. so there's one soul within us, so we have one spirit soul that is guiding uh, this body um, but there are souls present even in different, air, in the air in different, like, you know, living entities you know, I was reading something about dust mites you may know about dust mites, right? Dust mites are like these invisible, things, but they're like little, like little, like crawling animals. There's a soul in that. So, like, just in this room, there's hundreds of millions of souls that we are seeing, experiencing a few. But within each of us is one soul. I mean, he was talking probably about the bacteria. If it's within our body, it might have a soul too. Right? Because oh, that's a living thing. Yeah, possibly. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Does COVID have a soul? <laughs> <laughs> it's a living entity, right? Uh, when, when, we, the, when we take the blood test or something, we see the bacteria, mm -hmm. and the blood cells, and all the things. They are all they are That's all matter. All matter. That's all matter. That's all matter. Those individual cells that are drawing energy and, and things, that's all matter. Because those cells disconnected from the source of the body, they perish. Right? They have no independent existence. They can't exist separated from the body. So that's how we understand its position. Yes? This idea of imperishable or yes. indestructible yes it sounds tiring <laughs> <laughs> in what way well when do we get a chance to like rest ah okay interesting <laughs> Very nice point so let's understand what first imperishable means what does imperishable mean to you this cannot be destroyed huh which cannot be destroyed which cannot be destroyed infinity infinity that always existed and will always exist, right? So 
So that's a good understanding of imperishable. It's eternal. There's nothing that can interrupt the eternality. There's nothing that can make it um, uh, have an end, right? So it is truly endless. So the reason we that 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 might feel is I like how you said, you know, exhausting, tiring. Because this body, is it eternal? Is it temporary? Is it temporary? This body needs rest. This body needs uh, replenishment. But spirit does not. So the experience of fatigue, of tired, was only experienced on the bodily plat the material platform. And because the soul is eternal, it has no withering of potency. The energy does not dissipate, right? The energy of my phone dissipates the moment it becomes disconnected from the charger. It will start to dissipate. That is the nature of all things material. But the spirit being sat chit ananda this eternal potency, it has no withering experience. So the soul is always full of energy, lively. And the soul never experiences anything but pure bliss. Why? Because one of the ingredients the soul is ananda. It is the nature of the soul to be happy. That is one of its constitutional ingredients, is ananda. So, the, in the soul, when it's in its eternal state, it is enjoying happiness at an ever-increasing rate. Now, this is something impossible for us to understand, because we know everything we enjoy in the material world, what happens to that enjoyment in time? Does it increase or decrease? Everything? My favorite movie, my favorite food stuff, my favorite activity, it always decreases. It may temporarily go up for a little bit, but ultimately, it disappears. But in the spiritual world, in our spiritual activities, that which gives happiness to the soul, it gets even sweeter and sweeter and sweeter, infinitum, it never ends. And there is never a feeling of, you know, needing to catch up or needing to rest or anything because it is made up of spirit. So that's why um, the, 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 the fatigue understanding is because, again, that's what we are experiencing through this material body. But the spiritual body has unlimited endless potency. Is that okay? Questions or comments? Yes. Uh, how does this uh, soul carry memory? Uh, I mean, memory? Memory. Does it carry memory or how does it use and how does it go to the uh, life? Oh, okay. So, good question. So, I said the body is made up of earth, air, fire, water, ether. Right? So, that is the gross body. There's also a subtle body. And then there is a spiritual body. Okay? Three bodies. Gross, subtle, spiritual. Gross, you can touch it. Feel it. What is my subtle body? It is my mind, intelligence, and false ego. Mind, intelligence, and as I go from mind to intelligence, false ego, it gets more and more subtle. So the mind, what is the mind? The mind is a giant database. <laughs> it's a storage unit of all of our desires. You ever get random thoughts in your head? You wonder, where did that come from? That's your mind. Your mind is constantly capturing different desires from things that we see, hear, taste, touch, smell, desire to, right? What is the goal of a great marketing firm? To create desires in our mind, to consume.
consume real estate in our mind. We see a billboard, I want that product. Where is that want stored? In the mind. So marketers are very adept at getting valuable real estate in our mind. And it's experienced through our senses, right? From all the things I see here, right? If I talk to you about the beautiful beaches of Hawaii, and how amazing the weather is, and the cool air, and the wonderful pineapple juice, what starts to manifest in your mind? A desire, right? I want to go there, right? How you got that desire? From hearing, right? So through our senses, we acquire different desires. That's the memory. That's the mind. Anybody have the experience where an idea pops in our head, and then this other voice says, don't do it. And then that mind pops even louder. And then the voice says, don't do it. And we still do it. Anybody have that experience? Yes. All of us? So what are those two voices? Intelligence. That's the intelligence. So the intelligence is the decision maker, the processor of those desires. Right? So what processes those desires is the intelligence. And the intelligence is a machine to make decisions. And Krishna will tell us later in this Bhagavad Gita that one should use the intelligence to control the mind, not the mind to control the intelligence. Right? Every crime that's happened virtually, the person knew they shouldn't do this. But the intelligence was not strong enough to control the mind's desires, and thus the action was performed. Every bad decision we've made, most of them we knew, I probably shouldn't do this. But still we do it. That is the mind overtaking the intelligence. So what to do? Strengthen the intelligence. Right? And when we have strong intelligence, the intelligence says no means no. And it subdues the mind. How to strengthen our intelligence? Take knowledge. Take knowledge. Studying this Bhagavad Gita is meant to, in, to strengthen our intelligence so that the, we start to make decisions not based on what the mind wants to do, but based on what is good for the soul. Because the mind will give lots of ideas. And this mind we have now, here comes the, you know, oh no, and oh that makes sense. This mind we have is the, once we come to the material world, every body we enter, we have the same mind, intelligence, false ego. So this mind, the intelligence, the false ego, and the soul, these four things, they go to the next gross body. So I'll, I will shed this gross body at some point. And then the mind, intelligence, false ego, and soul will go into the next body. So this memory I have is not just from this lifetime, but it's from many lifetimes. But Krishna tells us in the 15th chapter, He says, I allow you to forget your past lives, so you, you can try to have some semblance of peace. We can barely have peace in the mind's memory of this lifetime. So what to say if we could, if we were trying to process prior, it would be disastrous. So Krishna says, I, I, I give you the source of forgetfulness. So that's the mind and memory. Who is a stronger? Who, uh, false ego is a stronger or the mind is a stronger? Mm. If the intelligence is not strong. So the false ego is the most subtle of the three. Right? So mind we can kind of understand, right? Intelligence we can kind of understand. Now the false ego, this is what false ego is. So two parts of it, false and ego. Ego, what ego means? I am. So when you say, oh, this person has an ego, they really don't mean they have an ego. We all have an ego. 
is he has a false ego. He has a false sense of who he is. They think there's something better than him, right? That's what we mean by ego. It actually means we were more descriptive, more accurately is. We have a false ego. Ego means I am. So who am I? Spirit soul. Spirit soul. Y'all say your spirit soul? Now every day, every moment of your life, you're seeing yourself as spirit soul? That's because of false ego. So the false ego sits over the soul. It covers the soul. And so this understanding that I am spirit soul, which we can acquire you know, through conceptual understanding very easily, right? Why I don't see it in practicality? Because of the presence of the false ego. The false ego is giving me a false sense of who I am. Who do I think I am? Embodied. This body. Embodied. Embodied. Why do I keep thinking I'm the body? Presence of false ego. As soon as the false ego is dissipated, one has perfect understanding, I am spirit soul. And that's why, to your question earlier, I, I, I had a little bit, because a pure soul who has rid themselves of false ego can see with spiritual vision. So there's the feasibility of one being able to actually perceive the presence of soul. But that's in a very, you know, sort of out there scenario, so I didn't address it. But the point is, once we free ourselves of the false ego, this notion of being able to understand I'm spirit soul, to become free from all the material turbulences, to liberate the mind, that happens when we free our false ego. So what's the next logical question? How do we get <laughs> Anybody wants to know how to get rid of a false ego? Yeah, All of you? I'm going to give you a new secret today I have never given before. Y'all are ready? Yes. The secret to getting rid of the false ego? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. This is the only means to break the false ego. The false ego is very strongly built. So if you have, like, you know, um, um, a jewel inside of a giant rock, how do you extract that jewel? By breaking the rock. Mm -hmm. How much effort does it take to break that rock? It's long. It's long. But do you do it? I yes. order Why? <laughs> I order diamond. Because you want that precious gem. So you're willing to hammer and hammer and hammer and chisel away, chisel away, chisel, chisel, chisel away. No? If you want to find eternal peace and happiness, you have to chisel away at this false ego. It's not going to happen. You know, hey, you said chanting going away. I put my hand in the bead bag. I chanted, and that damn false ego is still there. What happened? You have to chisel, chisel, chisel away. It is a process. It is the proven process. It is the effective process. It is the only process. So the secret, the new information presented today will be the new information presented next week and the week after and the week after and the week after. So I'm previewing all the next future weeks. But this is the only means to break this false ego. Because it's too chanting. As Krishna himself says, Chaito Darpana Marjanam. To cleanse the mirror of the heart, one must take to this subject and as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu establishes this as the means to break this false ego. So if we want to be dira, more strong in our mind, we want to become free of this bodily conception, rise our platform to stop thinking about the car and thinking about us as a driver, how to do it? It is through good chanting of the Holy Name. It is the only way and it is the most effective.
course, people ask any other ways. What about this? What about that? <laughs> Actually, everything we do in devotional service, why we study Bhagavad Gita? To increase our faith in chanting. Why we do service in the temple? To increase our faith in chanting. Why we take honor for Shadam? To increase our faith in chanting. That should be the result of all of our devotional service is to give us more faith and enthusiasm to take to the process of chanting the Holy Mass. I could spend another hour on chanting the Holy Mass, but I won't. <laughs> Any other comments or questions before we chant? Thank you very much, Sir Prabhupada. Thank you. Thank you.